Saint Marcel Dixon is a Democratic candidate for the 6th Congressional District, which is currently served by United States Congressman Jim Clyburn. Mr. Dixon says he wants better education, better jobs, and reparations with direct payments to descendants. I talk one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Dixon for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Greg Marcel Dixon, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you for having me. You are a Georgia-born, South Carolina raised, and a Gala accent is how you describe yourself. You're also a teacher and activist and live in Ridgeland. You said that you want to fight for better education, better transportation, and reparations with direct payments to descendants for your district that you want to represent, six, the 6th Congressional District. Let me ask you, why this, why now? I mean, I keep asking myself, why has this not been done before? Because... After 1865, Black Americans here in the Low Country, where you are in Charleston, I am in Ridgeland, from Charleston down to Jacksonville, all that territory, Sea Islands, 30 Mile Inland, was supposed to be given to us as Black Americans. Abraham Lincoln, the founder of the Republican Party, signed that legislation. He was assassinated, and it never happened. Had we gotten all that land, we will be having wealth in the trillions right now as Black Americans. Because it never happened, in the days of slavery, we owed 0 0.5 in wealth. Today, we only own 2.6, okay? So this country has done reparations for Japanese Americans that were thrown in internment camps, for Native Americans, a variety of different tribes. We've done it for Holocaust survivors. Even though we've stopped the Holocaust, my great-grandfather, World War II vet, and we've doing it for people in Guam who are exposed to radiation. Joe Biden just extended the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. We've made other countries do reparations, such as the Japanese for the South Koreans. But we haven't done reparations for the people that we have wronged the most. And that is Black Americans. So it should have been done a long time ago. But I'm trying to make this country do what is right. I say repair Black America to fix America. It should be called repair Black America to save America. Well, what, okay, let me ask you this, Mr. Marcel. Uh, where is the land without this representation, without the reparations that is in your district, the 6th Congressional District? Where is the land? Yes, sir. The land is all around, but we've lost most of it. Black Americans amassed 16 million acres of property. The number one cause of lynching was not uh, lying by a white woman on a black man. It was black land theft. We've lost it through lynch malls. We've lost it to the system of heirs property, something that we in the low country know extremely well. We lost it to anti-black discrimination by the United States Department of Agriculture. Where does most wealth come from in the United States of America? Land ownership. White Americans receive hundreds of millions of acres of land from the four homestead acts that happened. The one where they was giving land to people to move here from England. The second one that Abraham Lincoln signed in 1861 that gave away 10% of the entire USA to get white Americans to settle out west. The Southern Homestead Act that was really supposed to be for black Americans but mainly most of it went into white American hands. And then the other one that's not talked about a lot was when we gave land to people who fought in the Revolutionary War to help us defeat Britain which black Americans did but were never given the land that they were owed. So because of that today, 48 to 60 million white American families can trace their wealth to those homestead acts. When we fought to get land or we built up our black Wall Streets, it was stolen from us or they were destroyed in the trillions of dollars that went with it. And yet, this country spends almost $100 million a day housing illegal immigrants. We've sent billions of dollars to Ukrainians who are not Americans. We've brought 100,000 over here who will be given homes, land, jobs, health care, food, and property for black Americans, 50 to 20% of the population, over 55% of the homeless. Our wealth is $24,000 compared to the average American's household wealth taking black Americans out, which is $122,000. We've gotten norm, we've normalized this. Every other group is comfortable demanding getting paid what they're owed. That's how the people of Guam are getting compensation for radiation exposure. They demanded what they were owed. That's how Japanese Americans got reparations. But when black Americans stand up to demand it, we're told, oh, it's too much, or we can't afford it. You did it, 
Now you have to pay for it. And before, I want to shut one thing down right now. Reparation does not come from any American taxpayer. It comes from the federal government. Federal government does not run off the taxes. They generate their own currency. They have to worry about inflation. But that is just about how much money goes into the economy at any given time, not how much money they generate and they spend. They can't afford it, and they have an obligation to do it. And I would love to talk to more about you, more about this, Mr. Marcel, but as you know, my time is very limited right now. But let me ask you, where has the lion been lost for black America in your district? All along the coast. Gullah Geechee people, which I am proudly so. I love it. We've lost the majority of our coastal land. Now we have to drive by beachfront resorts, tennis clubs, golf courses, and seeing people who are millionaires, billionaires, thousandaires, or probably more, enjoy themselves on land that we know we used to own. It's been lost along the riverfronts as well. Now we have multi-million dollar riverfront home, beachfront homes that was once upon a time Sea Island property. Hilton Head Island is one of the most glaring examples. 90% black to now 90% white. And I'm running against Congressman Clyburn, as you know. I challenge anyone to find one piece of legislation he's written to stop black land from being stolen or at least to compensate us for the land we've lost. Beachfront resorts are getting billions of dollars, if not trillions, from money that people are spending on the behalf of tourism. But the people who had that land stolen from them, we are living in abject poverty. His district, Gullah Geechee majority, is the sixth poorest in the United States of America out of 435 districts total. He has not written one piece of legislation to deal with black homelessness, black poverty, nor reparations, nor land theft. And he's what had is, 30 years to do so. What is the poverty rate in your district? The poverty rate in my district is 30%. The what average is, poverty rate in the United States is 11%, just by contrast. But I must address something. Yes, if you go to some districts, the poverty rate is as high as 70%. Williamsburg County, Allendale County. And if you take just the black population and you go by what the um, uh, USDA free and reduced lunch has, right. the black population, the poverty rate is over 80%. And I want to keep in mind, American poverty rate is 11%. Compare that to Clyburn's district of 30 and in some counties like Allendale, almost 70%. Unforgivable. Now, now uh, how much, well, well, let me ask you this, how many students in your district are actually receiving free or reduced lunch right now, Marcel? I'm in Jasper County, so we have 90, 89 to 95% at any given time receiving free and reduced lunch. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, and I want to get back to that in just a second, but I have some other questions I really need to ask you. You said this, quote, I am running because James Clyburn in the Congressional Black Caucus could push President Joe Biden to issue an executive order to start a committee for reparations and also bring back the Freedmen's Bureau, but it has not been done. You also say that Black America needs real representation. What is that right. representation right now? That representation right now is pretty much non-existent outside of me. Okay, I'm running on a platform of doing things that the Democrats will have us believe black Americans support and are good for black Americans, but they are not. Illegal immigration, not good for black Americans. Even legal immigration is not. That's been a historical fact, and the data shows that higher level immigration, the lower rate of wages, higher black unemployment rate, higher incarceration rate of black Americans, lower marriage rate of black Americans, um, uh, abortion, 20 million black babies aborted. When you have lower numbers, you have less political and social influence. The reason Joe Biden is saying the Hispanics, whatever race they want to call themselves, is the future is because their numbers are growing. Black American numbers are growing too, but not at the rate it could have been had we not aborted our 20 million black babies. The more numbers you have, the more political representation you have. And it's just the fact that a child with a beating heart and a cerebral activity is a living human being who deserves the right to live. Third thing, gun confiscation. I'm for gun legislation, but not for taking people's guns. Black Americans more than any group 
We need to be well armed and well trained along with being well armed. So I'm standing up not just for reparation, but I'm also standing against certain things that have hurt the black community that the Democrats will have you thinking, and I'm running as a Democrat, but I'm running the way a Democrat really should be. The Democrats will have you thinking that black Americans are for all the illegal immigrants you can get. And no, we are not, and it's harmful to us, and I'm going to stand on that ground. Now, Mr. Marcel, let me ask you this. Knowing that you, what you know now, sir, would you... I mean, looking back to the, you know, then to now, would you have ran as a, as a Republican? No, because the Republicans uh, have not done anything to earn black votes. Once upon a time, the Republicans were the pro-black party. The Republicans are the party of reparations. Abraham Lincoln did reparations for descendants of American slaves, which is why I don't get why the Republicans are so against it. Ronald Reagan, who I hate, did reparations for the Japanese Americans. The Republicans historically have been the party to say, we owe these people, let's do it. If the Republicans go back to being that way, I will be there right there. But no, I am running as a Democrat because one, the Democrats will not exist without my people's vote. So they owe my people and I'm going to go and make sure they we get what we are owed. Two, I get sick and tired when the Democrats, when we tell them how bad black America is doing for the fact that our, our wealth is going down. We have the lowest income we own almost no land. We make up nearly 60% of the homeless. I can go on and on and on and on. And they say, well, it's the Republican. No, I vote for you. 90, 95% of American votes go to the Democrats. If I buy a TV and that TV is defective and I bought that TV from Best Buy, I would look like a damn fool if I took that TV to Walmart or to Target. They will tell me, go to Best Buy. That's who you bought it from. Likewise, if we vote for the Democrats 90 to 95%, if the Democrats would not be able to exist without black Americans, then we have a right to hold the Democrats accountable. So I am a Democrat. I have my own mind. I'm running as a Democrat. But people must understand, I am not a Democrat first. I am black first, black American first, and I am going to run accordingly, and if any of the Democrats don't like it, well, too bad, because I ain't going away anytime soon, and if I happen to die, I'm going to haunt you, so you're going to be seeing a lot more of me. Now, what yeah. is the average income in the 6th Congressional District? The average income is 41163 but a, a white Americans who have the highest income, which is still pretty low, is forty eight to 56000 Black Americans at a high end we only make $28,000 in South Carolina's 6th Congressional District, a majority black district with a so-called a black leader. We only make $28,000. Okay, $20,000, nearly $20,000 lower than the average income. Who are we going to blame for that? The Republican? No, we have a Democratic representative. He is responsible. He's had 30 years to do something about him, like passing a living wage, and he hasn't. What would be the ideal livable wage right now for your district? For well, my district, for the country, a livable wage will start at twenty five dollars. That's what the, I'm not. I'm not doing that low ball crap of fifteen. You know, fifteen. Let's not be. Let's not go too far. No, twenty five dollars. The average, according to research, twenty five dollars an hour is what it takes for an average person to be able to afford at least a two bedroom apartment, apartment, nearly anywhere in the United States of America. So twenty five dollars an hour. I'm standing on that ground too. Now, going back to reparations, Mr. Marcel, where would the money come from to become quote our money unquote? It will come from the federal government, the same way the Japanese reparations came from the federal government, Native American reparations came from the federal government, stimulus checks came from the federal government, PPP loans that people have like to pay back came from the federal government, the, the trillion of dollars to make the vaccines distributed came from the federal government, building out the auto industry, the banking industry, the airline industry, the hotel industry, the cruise industry, the name, the real estate industry, federal government, uh, 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 Afghani refugees, federal government, Ukrainian refugees, federal government, okay? To uh, canceling and uh, tax breaks for the wealthy, federal government. Everything comes from the federal government. And why can the federal government do that? Because the U.S. is a monetary sovereign. They can make as much money as they need. And before anybody comes around here talking about debt, the debt, the debt, the debt, the debt, the debt, the debt, miss me with the BS. Debt in the U.S. is actually a way to put money in the economy. The U.S. sells its debt by yellow dollars for our treasury bonds. Families buy them, people buy them, countries buy them, businesses buy them, but most of all, banks, investment firms, credit unions buy them. And that's how they're able to give us loans, and that puts money in the economy. And anytime the U.S. wants, they take those yellow dollars, and they can give them green dollars. So debt actually generates money. So the U.S. federal government 
will be the provider of the money. No, it does not come from taxes. State governments run on taxes, not the federal government. Anybody who wants to challenge me, I suggest you take your government, federal, and American economy, economic class 101. Let me move on, Mr. Marcel. I'm running out of time here. Are you personally an American descendant of slavery, FBA, B1, and, and, and obviously uh, industry? And ancestry, I'm sorry. I am Gullah Geechee. My family ancestry, it almost makes me mad. I can't get out of South Carolina. Every time I think I'm going to get out of South Carolina, my mother's side, uh, Prince Williams um, Parish, which was once what Beaufort County, Jasper County, Carlton County, right. Hampton County was all called. St. Louis Parish, Beaufort County, Georgetown, right. uh, Charleston County. So yes, Gullah Geechee, my mother and father's side, South Carolina coast. I am so proud to be yeah. a Gullah Geechee descendant. Now, how do you propose to fix the American descendants of slave lease of FBA's B1 specifically? Well, my reparations platform, it's called a better deal for black America. The reason I call it that is because when Roosevelt did his new deal, uh, black Americans were mainly excluded. He was a racist and he wrote the, bi the bill and sent it to the states because he knew the states had Jim Crow laws that would exclude any black Americans. He didn't want black Americans to benefit. He was a racist bigot and I can't stand the idiot. Now, I'm going to do a better deal for black Americans. Direct monetary payments. Bring back the Freedmen's Bureau to take care of all the needs of black Americans like they tried to do after slavery. I'm going to bring it back so they can finish their job. Making us tax exempt. Having us bringing back the black communities. Incentivizing us to come back to rural land by land grants the Freedmen's Bureau will oversee. Getting us back to black farming. We never abandoned farming. We were ran off our farms by the United States Department of agriculture, having us have our own schools, our own uh, police system, judicial system, the way Native Americans do. And I am also a fan of separation. Yes, I meant exactly what I said. When I say separation, I mean black thriving communities where we bring back our black Wall Street. We live amongst ourselves. Integration was good as far as getting rid of Jim Crow and redlining, but we should have never left out of our communities. We should have fought to get what we were owed. So I want to bring the black community back, having black people live amongst ourselves. It will be a beautiful thing. Where are the black vibrant communities right now in South Carolina? I mean, vibrant, all of our communities are vibrant. We are culturally rich people. Gullah Geech, we have our own language, food, folklore, magic, history, uh, attire, obviously, our accent, but it's materially, it's materially poor, culturally rich, materially poor. So a community is not uh, poor because they don't have money. Because you can still be culturally rich, but materially we're poor. And that is not fair. We should be able to enjoy being culturally rich. We should be able to enjoy being materially rich, especially when you consider the first source of significant wealth for the first 13 colonies was rice that was grown by the Gullah Geechee, indigo. Do you see those footprints and fingerprints in Charleston and down Savannah when you smell the human stench in those dungeons? That was our people. Okay, so we deserve to be materially rich because we earned it and we haven't been paid it, which is why I refer to reparations as a debt this nation owes us. But going back to what you asked, uh, basically said earlier, what exactly, where exactly are the black thriving communities in South Carolina? Oh, Ridgeland. I mean, Mitchellville and Ridgeland. Okay, you have uh, uh, Walterboro. You have Hampton, which all of downtown Hampton is many black owned businesses. I mean, you pretty much can drop a pin in the coast of South Carolina and you're likely to land among a thriving black community. Roseland, Low Bottom, Pearlstein, Cherry Point. Th those are my two areas. That's where I grew up, Cherry Point. Okay, I'm in Roseland right now. So it's really very rich black communities. But they're culturally rich, materially poor, as the data shows, and getting poor because we're losing our land and we're almost landless. So i doubling down on that. All throughout this country, you will find culturally rich black communities, but we need to be materially rich as well. We're the materially, mat materially poor communities here in South Carolina. Oh, all over. South Carolina District 6. <laughs> I mean, that's why we're the six poorest in the United States of America out of 435. Allendale has a part as one as the 10th poorest county in America. 
Williamsburg is even poorer than Allendale. I couldn't find any data on where it ranks nationally, but if Allendale is the 10th poorest county in the U.S., then Williamsburg must be 8 or 9. You got North Columbia that has the highest rate of amputation in the country. Black people getting their arms and legs chopped off because they have food deserts and healthcare deserts and are extremely impoverished. That's one. I can go on. Okay, Ridgeland, materially poor. Okay, Hardyville being gentrified, but the black people there live in deep poverty. I mean, it's too many communities to name. Now, where exactly are the food deserts in your district? The food deserts in my district, Pineland, Carborough, uh, Sand Hill, where people mm -hmm. can drive for 10 miles or more and not even pass a grocery store, let alone a gas station. That's the definition of a food desert, 10 miles or more, and you don't have access to a grocery store. Let's talk about health care deserts. That's even Ridgeland, because we got to drive to Hardyville to get to a hospital, and even their capacity is very limited, and we end up having to go to Savannah. So pretty much all of Jasper County is in a health care desert. Allendale has one grocery store, but it's a massive county, so people live far out. Food deserts. Food deserts is all around. Yamasee, 10 right, miles right. or more, won't pass a grocery store. Hesto. Right. I mean, it's... I, I mean, if you told me, I could have had the long list ready and just spent most of the interview reading it off to you. Now, Mr. Marcel, where exactly in your district are counties being, or areas, excuse me, are being gentrified right now? Hardyville, Ridgeland, um, pretty much right now. You can see it happening. It's not necessarily in my district, but right. it's on the border of my district. You can see it happening all throughout Beaufort County and St. Helena and St. Helena. Right. Okay. It hasn't quite started yet. But you can see in Williamsburg, it's starting to happen. Charleston, North Charleston, it's happening. With black Americans being forced out of their communities because, one, they're trying to run a road through, Rosemont, for example. Right. And sometimes the tax price is going up so high because they are expanding the ports. They are expanding the plant there and running the black Americans off. So just Jasper County as a whole and North Charleston as a whole. But Columbia, it is starting to happen. You know, you got communities over there that are close to downtown right. or parts of North Columbia right. where black people are no longer being able to afford because of the expansion of University of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not happening in my district, it's happening right on the border of my district in South Carolina District 1 with St. Helena, a right. quintessential Gullah Geechee town. Now, Mr. Marcel, let me ask you this. What are the tax prices right now up here in Rosemount? But other what? I'm sorry. Yeah, the tax prices right now currently in Rosemount. Where were they, where are they now, and where were they ten years ago? It depends on where you live, but in some parts of North Charleston, I don't know about Rosemont specifically, the tax price could be as high as twelve thousand dollars a year. Okay, and in some areas, once upon a time, it was as low as two to three thousand dollars a year. They do have that homestead exemption where if a person of age lives on the property, right. they can get a major uh, discount in their taxes. But for a variety of reasons, when you're dealing with heirs property, people because my family's going through this. You're not, you don't want to sign the property over to an older person because they now have all the rights. People want to keep their share. And because of that, the prices will be as high as $12,000, as high as $20,000. And when you got people who are only making $28,000 a year, $12,000 in a month is, is, is almost half of what they make in a year. Now, Mr. Marcel, who in Rosemount or even in your 6th uh, Congressional District, who's actually benefiting from that Homestead Act? It was supposed to be the black families that have an elderly person above the age of, I think, 55 to 60. So they can benefit from it. But like I said, the downside is 70% of black landowners live on heirs property. South Carolina is ground zero for heirs property. So most of the time you have to sign the land over to one of the heirs. People are reluctant to do that because they don't want to give up their share. Like my father, he can do that with my grand aunt, but he doesn't want to because he doesn't want to give up his share. And I don't blame him. It's not that he doesn't trust her. It's that he doesn't want to give up his share. So really the homestead exemption for people who live on heirs property ends up not being beneficial to us because you have to give up your share to one family member in order to get it and you have to really trust that family member is going to relinquish your share and give it back to you and we know that's a very very dicey situation and what else let me ask you this mr marcel 
you, you talk obviously about gentrification. Where exactly are black Americans going here in your district when they're being gentrified? I've asked that question a lot as well, because I've ne- I always see research about us being gentrified. But I'm like, where do we go? We don't go up in the sky. So I found out, according to data, they're pushed into further rural areas, like, you know, Monk's Corner, for example. And I found out, this is really heartbreaking, they're pushed into apartments. But when you go from owning land to being pushed into an apartment, what you was paying on taxes to keep your land now goes to an apartment complex. The difference is, when you can't afford an apartment, after three months, you're out on the streets. You don't have that land to go to in which you could possibly put a mobile home and live there. Now you don't have a safety net. So when you drive through Charleston, you see all those black faces are homeless on streets that have the fingerprints and footprints of their ancestors who built it. It's because we've lost land. The only source of wealth we've had from which we have not been able to benefit because when you don't have land, you don't have a safety net. So when you lose that apartment, you have nowhere to go. You out on the street. And, and so that's where they're going. Going, and, and you know, I want to ask you this too: How have you personally encouraged Black people in your district so far to save money, invest in family, land, and real estate? The good news is I don't have to encourage Black people to do that at all, because according to all the studies, Black Americans save more than any other racial and ethnic group, even though the irony is we have the least to save. When they've done UBI experiments, universal basic income experiments, and they've given it to Black families and families of other racial and ethnic groups, the data shows Black families are the most frugal with their money. They're more likely to spend it on bills food, and clothing, because they're trying to survive, than all other racial and ethnic groups who are more likely to spend it on leisure. Black Americans actually put more money aside than any other ethnic group. The sad thing is we have the least amount of money to save. And all the other thing is, Black Americans, even when we have a little bit of more money, we are the most likely to have to help a family member out who lives in poverty. So the issue is not teach us how to save and invest our money, because no other group has ever had that thrown at them. When Japanese Americans got reparations, no one asked them if they were investing and saving well. No one asked how the car survivors if they invest and save well. No one asked the Ukrainians country would had a corrupt government if they invest and save well. No one's asking these illegal immigrants to whom Joe Biden wants to give $450,000 to for breaking the law if they invest and save well. So I don't care how well my people invest and save. I encourage being frugal with your money and being wise, but black Americans are already ahead of the curve. We are behind the curve because of an issue that is not our fault, and that's this country not paying us reparations. What reparation figures would be a starting point right now? $70 trillion. Where, and tell me, I mean, how would you distribute that to the, the uh, obviously the descendants? Direct monetary payments per person. The United States of America will give us treasury bonds, yellow dollars, and they will pay us interest on that in perpetuity. They will pay us the interest on that. So that will average to around $89,000, $100,000 uh, per person, per descendant of American slaves. All black people do not get reparations. Just descendants of American slaves. And they will pay us that into perpetuity. And how many of those descendant slaves are in your district right now? In my district right now, it's around, it's only 700,000 people in my district, and the black population is around 400, uh, 450,000. Okay. And I would love to talk to you more about this and ask you some more follow up questions and all that stuff, but I'm running out of time. I got to go tape another okay. interview. But uh, Mr. Greg Marcel Dixon, thank you for your time and welcome to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you so much, and I'll look forward to speaking to you again. I'm sure people will have follow-up questions, because I have follow-up answers. (laughs) Thank you.